So hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Naomi Aladef. I am with the National Wildlife Federation. Um, I'm based out of Missoula. And um, today you're here for the Garden for Wildlife talk. So if you're not here for Garden for Wildlife, you're welcome to stay, um, but or you can go wherever you're supposed to be. Um, but uh, a little bit about myself. These are my, my babies. I have a one-year-old puppy and a one-year-old kitten who love and hate each other all at the same time. Um, I am an avid gardener. I have a wildlife degree, so I try to come at this from both of those angles. And I'll do my best to share whatever knowledge I have. And um, I recognize also that a lot of people in this room have more knowledge than I do. So um, I am just here to share information on using native plants to support wildlife. Um, the National Wildlife Federation was started in 1936 by Dean Darling. Um, if you're not familiar with him, he was a famous cartoonist and um, created the, the legacy that is National Wildlife Federation that we know of now. We're the longest and oldest conservation organization in the country. Um, and we have a, a 50 state um, affiliation. Um, this is our region. So I'm in the Northern Rockies, Prairies and Pacific region. So I'm in like the top left corner up there. Is that my mouse? What is this blue thing? Do you know what this blue thing is? Maybe it's not bothering me, but okay. Um, just be. So I'm in. Uh, I'm based out of Missoula, so I'm actually not that far from Caldwell. So this is a really. This is my first time being here. Hi, welcome. Hey. This is my first time coming up to this event, so I'm really excited to be here to share this information. Um, but my objective. I'm an educator at heart. That is my role at NWF, and I work on communicating with the public about gardening, about wildlife. I connect kids and families with nature, and I also work a lot with teachers. So I engage a lot with, hi, welcome. I engage a lot with um, teachers all over the state, Idaho, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And I work with a, a, pro, a free online program called Eco Schools USA. So um, I wear a lot of hats. I'm also on the Montana Environmental Education Association Board. So if any is one familiar with Mia, and I'm also the project wet coordinator for the state. Long story short, that means I work on getting kids outside. And one of the ways we do that is through gardening. Um, one of our uh, greatest advocates is, I realize also you can see it. There we go. One of our greatest advocates is also an ambassador is Ranger Rick. How many of you are familiar with Ranger Rick? I see a lot of hands. Yeah. If you haven't visited our booth, um, we are downstairs. This is Eliza Lindley, everybody. Hi. Um, <laughs> Eliza is with me today. She's our AmeriCorps member for the year and gets to come and do events like this and also goes into the classroom and also teaches about gardening. But we use Ranger Rick um, as our ambassador. He's over 50 years old. He's getting us there, but he still looks fantastic. <laughs> um, it has also expanded to be more than just the Ranger Rick magazine. We also now have Ranger Rick Jr. and Ranger Rick Cub. Um, and so the Cub is for zero to four, four to seven, seven to 12. And it works. Uh, it looks at little little animals, juvenile animals, and adult animals. So kids get to learn about all of them. And as I said, uh, I I manage our Garden for Wildlife program with the help of Eliza. I also do all of our outreach for National Wildlife Federation in this whole region, and I manage our Eco Schools program. So if anyone in this room is a teacher or in some capacity, please come talk to me after. I'd love to give you some resources. All right, so NWF, our mission is to um, ensure that wildlife and people survive in a rapidly changing world. So recognizing climate change, working to combat climate change for wildlife and for people so that we can all continue to enjoy wildlife and do things like gardening. Um, that is our mission. All right, so we're gonna talk about the garden program today. Um, I'm curious in the room, how many of you or on Zoom are gardeners? And I know that's a kind of a silly question at this event, but I know some people are new to the hobby, um, whether you're into mason bees or plants or trees or seeds or whatever it is you're into. Um, we have been inspiring and working towards getting people into gardening since 1973. So we do this lots of different ways. Um, but the main way we do this is our Garden to Wildlife program. And a component of that is, uh, I will get into the details, um, but we we start at uh, the bottom, and who can who can just shout out? What is the where do you start if you're like, all right, I want to bring wildlife into my space? What do you? Huh? Soil is a great start. A lot of people don't start there, and I think everyone should. 
Um, but for those of us who are maybe don't have a soil kit or don't test the soil, which I think you should, um, we ask everyone to start with plants. No, it's not working. There it goes. All right. So plants which need healthy soil are the foundation of our ecosystem. If you bring in plants, you'll bring in insects. If you bring in insects, you will bring in birds and butterflies and other critters. And if you bring them in, you should be bringing in predators and larger, larger birds. Um, my philosophy is if I see an aerial predator, if I see a owl or a hawk or something in my yard, I feel like mission accomplished. I've done my job. Um, so urban habitats especially are critical to piecing together different gardens and different spaces all across this landscape. So the number one threat to wildlife is habitat fragmentation. I know that my little quarter acre garden is not going to save mink, but I can try. And my little space will connect to someone else's space, which will connect to someone else's space, which connects to somebody else. And eventually they'll get to the forest. Maybe they'll be okay. But even, um, not even critters that walk, it's birds and bees and butterflies. I want to be able to provide them stopping sites, stopover sites to get where they need to go. So my goal with gardening for wildlife is to get people to turn what you see on the left into what you see on the right. So insects are the next critical level of the food web. 90% um, of insects that eat plants develop and reproduce only on the native plants they co-evolved with. So 90%. And therefore, they share that evolutionary history with them. Um, more than 85% of flowering plants require an insect for pollination, which uh, we have over 470 different bee species in Montana, and they all pollinate something different. There's a lot of overlap too, but they all pollinate our native plants. So kinnikinick, elderberry, huckleberries, right? How many of you go huckleberry picking, right? Native bees and other pollinators. So thinking about native plants, um, as we know, plants are particularly important. Um, as I said, these species have co-evolved over tens of thousands of years to not only be successful in the area that they are living in, but also with the wildlife that also exists. Um, so native plants and native wildlife life cycles are in sync and they cannot survive without each other. And as climate change becomes more has a stronger effect, those cycles are getting, are getting more and more out of sync. So it's really important that we plant native plants that are well adapted to Montana. So uh, they are the best plants to provide food, cover, and places to raise young. They're low maintenance, and once established, planted in the right conditions, they are adapted to the local soil, climate, and the weather conditions. Native plants support up to 60% uh, more insects than an exotic. So if you're planting native lupine, in, or sorry, if you plant like an ornamental lupine and thinking it's like the same, which it's very, very similar, it's, it's ornamental. The native lupine is gonna attract and maintain more insects on your property than a, an ornamental. Um, so let me give you an example. And this one is one of my favorites. Um, some of you might be familiar with Dr. Doug Tallamy. He's done a ton of research on native plants and wildlife. Um, and he's a partner of NWF. Um, so he did a study um, and found that, for instance, the willow and it, willows, so genus Salix, um, serve as a caterpillar host, not only for food that certain species live on, but 309 different species of caterpillars rely on the willows. 309 species, not just use, but rely on our native willows. Um, oaks, which we only have like one oak species, it's like 500 and something native caterpillars. So all of our willows compare that to, for example, here we go, uh, Giko, which supports zero. Beautiful tree. This picture is from my mom's yard, who I think is on Zoom. <laughs> um, beautiful, beautiful photo, or beautiful tree. Absolutely gorgeous, not native. Does not support native caterpillars and moths. Um, so that's an example. So the act of uh, gardening is planting with a purpose. So what it boils down to is that wildlife need plants to survive. 
Specifically, they need native plants to survive that are that they co-evolved with in their region. So that's what we try to do. We try to support people to plant native, use native plants to support wildlife. So this is planting with a purpose. Other wildlife are important too. They need habitat. So this is for birds and butterflies. Um, hummingbirds are the kinds of wildlife that are typically attracted to a garden like this. Um, I really love birds, especially. This is a great conversation to have with kids a lot too. Um, but this also means other wildlife beyond birds and butterflies will benefit from your habitat garden. Um, insects are incredibly diverse. Amphibians like this northern leopard frog, unique to not, not unique, but native to Montana, they are on the back line in western Montana. So your space, if you can provide water, if you can provide native plants, they are going to benefit from this. Um, it will even include wildlife that might frighten you. Um, but as I said, if you have predators coming into your space, that's mission accomplished. You have gone up the, the tiers and they are like, great, the things that I need exist in this space. Um, animals like snakes are incredibly important. Most species, most of our snakes are 100% harmless. The only one we have is the prairie rattlesnake. Um, everything else, like they might look kind of honoring, but they're like, they're not. Um, one of the questions I get a lot is if I put out a, a feeder, a water feeder for bees and butterflies, I'm gonna get wasps and hornets. Yes, you will. They also need water to survive, but it's the it's the pros and cons of inviting wildlife into your space. Um, I, had, I have currently paper wasps that have decided to take up residence in my umbrella. And I didn't know this until last year. My norm was to knock them out because it's right under my umbrella. It's like three feet above me. And I learned that if you leave them alone, which I know sounds you know, instinctually counterintuitive, they don't bother you. And so I let them go all last year and I never had a problem. Now that's paper wasps, that's not all wasps, but the paper wasps are so docile. I just let them do their thing and they pollinated my peppers and tomatoes and they didn't bother me also. Like, all right, you guys can like keep doing your thing. Um, it also will include garden nuisances. If you have deer and they're a problem with your hand, yeah. Huh? No. None of those are problems? Well, you're lucky. Um, <laughs> Just being a joke. Yeah, yeah. Some of these critters are a nuisance. Um, we're not asking you to welcome every creature, but right, just fence them out if it's a real problem. Just remember, there's no such thing as a deer-proof plant. It's If you read that, stop reading the article. It's wrong. There's deer-resistant. There are plants that are unpalatable or maybe even like very irritating to the critter. I've never seen a deer, like uh, geraniums are supposed to be deer proof. My mother-in-law plants them and they are hosed down by the same deer every, you know, the same group of deer every year. So I don't buy that anything's deer proof. You can try deer resistant plants. You can fence them out. Um, you're gonna, those are critters that we have to work with. Um, waiting till when you put your trash out will keep some of the pests away, some of the raccoons. I don't think they're pests. I think they're precious, but I mean, they're our mascot, so I can't hate raccoons. Um, but when you create wildlife habitat, uh, predators will show up. And this, like I said, this is a good thing. Um, animals like foxes, hawks are perfectly safe to have as neighbors and play an important ecological role. And remember the wildlife habitat garden also includes people. This is my niece picking up her first salamander. She thought it was excellent. Um, but this does mean we are trying to make this better for ourselves as well. So if you have a garden space and you have kids around, if you're at a school, there are so many ways that you can make this inviting to people as well. All right. So uh, it's just not try to get some just try the mouse. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I, I did that okay. I know. And now it's not on your screen. I think it's cool. I don't know. All right, so all wildlife need four things to survive. Anyone want to shout them out? I do this with kids all the time. What are the four things every critter needs to look, to survive? Food, water. Oh, are they on the street? They are on the street. Food, water. What is it? Shelter. Shelter and places to raise young. Exactly. When I tell that with kids, I use the word space because I try to identify the students. If we all lived in this one room, could we survive? No. 
for like a couple of days, maybe, but like over time, like that's not sustainable. So all species need a certain amount of space. So chickadees need 150 feet about versus a mountain lion, which needs like 150 miles. Every critter needs a different amount. So food, water, cover, and places to raise young. So we're gonna get into some of these elements and with all of these elements combined, we're only missing heart. You can help save the planet. Nobody knows Captain Kirk. Okay, good. I get nervous because it's like it's like waning. It's like going away. All right. So food for wildlife. Um, as I said, so Carolina chickadees, or not Carolina, uh, black cap chickadees and mountain chickadees. Um, the first thing the first thing you need, I said, is is food. They can this can be a lot of different ways. So that's cone seeds, nuts. Um, you can use supplemental feeders as well, but I really, really encourage you to start with the plant that's offering the same thing that's in your feeder. So if you keep putting out thistle, consider planting something that's gonna offer that food source instead, because not only will that occur naturally in its own cycle, but the birds um, will get the cover that comes from that plant as well, the safety from that cover. Um, and I, I also have heard people say that I shouldn't put out supplemental feeders because the birds get used to it. That's that's not really the case. But they found that they've done studies that show that the birds are they might become used to it, like because it's in your yard. But if you remove it, they will move on to find something else. there's food. So I, I worry about that with kids especially because they think if I put the feeder out and I take it away, I'm killing that bird. No, they're going to move on to something else that offers. So instead, offer them a real plant that comes in its own cycle. All right, uh, they prov provide food in a lot of different ways as well. So berries, fruits, cones, seeds, as I said, and all of these critters require, have different food requirements. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Use the flower, hammer, and anchor chips workshop. Good for them. Plan. <laughs> yeah, let's try that. Would you mind? Thank you. I'm afraid it's not going to. It won't. Well, we'll try. It's, it's, we'll try. All right. Plants also produce nectar, which is the primary source for butterflies and bees. So if you're planting something that has a nectar, later it's going to have um, a berry or seed or a nut. So you're getting both of those parts of the life cycle, and therefore you're providing food for different creatures at different times of the year. So that's why I say plant, put the plant in the ground. The feeders are great if you kind of need it to get going or you want to invite something that might not be in your yard, but consider using the plant itself. Hummingbirds and moths, moths also rely on nectar from plants as their primary food source. Um, anyone know what this critter is on the left? Yeah. So we have a hummingbird and a hummingbird. They're beautiful. All right. It like times out. Okay. Um, plants provide food also in other ways like sap. So if you have woodpeckers in your area, that's also another good sign. Um, we have woodpeckers and sap suckers. Pollen is an important food source for bees and other insects. Uh, bees feed their young pollen and without that they can't survive. Um, some animals will eat the foliage. Some animals only plant their or lay their eggs on the foliage. So again, that plant is offering so much more than just the berry. It's offering cover, it's offering space for the uh, critter to lay their eggs on, pollen, um, shade. When it gets really hot, it's also offering safety. And again, all of these plants have evolved to this area, so they've evolved, they've co-evolved with the wildlife that rely on them. Uh, native plants are also the foundation of the food chain. So I said, if you plant, you put plants in the ground, you'll get insects and then you will get the birds that come with it. Um, the importance of insects as a food source cannot be overstated. Everything eats insects, including other insects, spiders, small mammals, frogs, lizards, and birds. Um, Yes. All right. So 96% um, of backyard birds rely on insects as their primary food source, predominantly themselves, but to feed their young. And this is a fascinating. <clears throat> oh. 
Um, this one's a fascinating example. Um, a study in 2021 found that Carolina chickadees, one pair of the chickadee parents had to catch between 6,000 and 9,000 insects in order to raise one nest of young. And they did that within 150 meters of their nest. Wow. 150 feet, excuse me, 150 feet of their nest. So it's an incredible amount of insects to find in only 150 feet radius. Um, again, plant the plants that are going to bring in the insects, and you're going to get the ability to help these. This is a Carolina chickadee, but you know, a similar story. Um, that is wildlife conservation at the scale of your yard. So once you've planted, planted native plants and created a food web, um, you could then add in a, su a few supplemental feeders. Um, again, it's not gonna make or break the, the food system in your area, but it will help. Um, one thing I always remind people is please clean your feeders. Doesn't sound like something we would need to do, but just rinse them out from time to time with some like vinegar water and let them air dry really well, especially if you're using a hummingbird feeder. That can start to grow bacteria in like, three days. Um, and you don't need the red food coloring. So that will also attract more bacteria because it's just the red dye. Um, but hummingbird feeders especially, please just clean them. Otherwise, they are fantastic. All right. These are some pictures I've taken. Um, <clears throat> I planted mammoth sunflowers because I wanted to see how big they would get. Has anyone done this? Amazing. They're huge. That is my shed. And they're almost to the basketball court. That was early in the season. Then they got their heads and it was like another three feet. They like started weighing down and I couldn't park my truck. They're huge. But they were so fun. We had, I know it's not native, but again, I was just like, I'm trying to plant as many natives as possible, but I don't want, I don't want the message to be, you can't plant anything non-native. I still plant tomatoes and peppers and basil. It still brings in a ton of pollinators. The birds were all over these things. It was a, it was, it was wild. Um, yeah, that was just a fun experiment. I just wanted to see what would happen, and they delivered. Um, but birds are fond of, are fond of pollen, sand, uh, seeds, berries, insects, and nectar. So anything that's flowering is going to provide something for our native wildlife. For the record, I did have uh, Indian blanket flower in another spot, so I did, <laughs> I do have native plants. I just had to try the mammoths. They're fun. Um, and if a predator, predatory hawk does show up at your feeder, um, remember that you're putting out seed for small birds. It's going to attract a predator. That is OK. Um, uh, if it bothers you, take them down. But the one bird that you might see sacrificed did also help feed you know, an entire hawk family. So that's kind of good. Um, but uh, focus on feeding the songbirds and then spread out your plants and that will help distribute safety for the little birds. All right, the last step would be, uh, you'll also end up with other predators and they are good too. We have garter snake, super, super helpful friend in your garden if you don't have them. Um, hmm? Yeah, um, and mice, you'll end up with mice, that's okay. Um, this is not what we're talking about when we say provide food for wildlife. We're talking about natural food sources. Please do not feed or leave pet food outside. Oh my goodness. Please stop. Bears too, but like smaller critters. Um, it can create a dangerous situation. Um, they, they could spread disease. It could get into a fight with your dog. I mean, there are just other problems that we can just avoid entirely. Um, and the other thing is it can end fatally for the animal, either in malnutrition or animal control. And either way, I don't want to be contributing to that. So feed your pet inside, especially if you have bears. And in Montana, this is common, especially in Western Montana. If you have city ordinances, please follow them. A fed bear is a dead bear. So if you like seeing the bear, don't feed it. And I know this is like, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but I still have to say my, my soap cut. Um, they can become, they will become habituated to food source. Songbirds will not. Bears absolutely will. All right. Um, and good luck with them. This is never going to be stopped. Um, <laughs> you can get a scroll fruit feeder. I, 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 no. I don't think they work that well, but it's fun to watch. The one that spins around is pretty good. That's my favorite. <laughs> yeah. There's like endless YouTube videos of those. They're great. Yeah. Um, all right. 
<clears throat> squirrels are the exception. They're incredibly crafty. They'll get inside your cage. Um, if you do find a find if someone invents a way to figure this out, you're gonna make a million dollars. All right. We just put a bowl out for the squirrel. <laughs> better than him. Dan, yeah. All right. So just because we call them bird baths does not mean only birds will use them. So talking about water, many critters will use. Uh, I don't know what they're doing down there, but yes, I've already written down the feedback okay. for next year. Um, <laughs> a lot of creatures will use the bird bath um, in addition to birds. Birds need it for drinking water, but also also to bathe. It's how they clean their feathers and get rid of mites and all kinds of things. Um, but chipmunks will use it. Um, squirrels will use it. Insects will use it. Snakes, toads, frogs, and even. So these are. I've heard too. Yeah. I guess that um, like in bird baths and stuff, maybe you should have like a base layer of rocks or something so nobody drowns. Yes. So if it's really deep, I would encourage you to put gravel on the bottom to raise that up. Um, and in fact, if you can, what would even be better is mud mud and gravel and the reason is and keep it full um so make it so that the critters won't drown especially reptiles and amphibians that's who you want to keep from drowning the birds like it shallow too but um if you put mud and rock at the bottom you'll get butterflies after that water evaporates which in the summer you know happens quickly they can puddle so they'll still get water and nutrients from the mud yes but yeah don't let it be too deep good good call um so lots of critters will use your bird baths or any kind of water source that you can provide. Not only is this going to be good for your insect population, which is what we're trying to attract at the beginning with plants, but so many animals will benefit, including our native birds. In fact, you'll get, you'll get some really fun friends who come visit you. Um, tree frog, we don't, not this tree frog, but um, we do have frogs that will come. And if you put a puddler, if you put a shallow bird bath or water bath on the ground and like kind of wiggle it into the ground, that's where you'll get snakes and frogs and toads and other insects. Hmm? That's good. I was going yeah. to ask that question. Oh. Yep. Put it, put it down on the bottom. Just kind of wiggle it down. Um, you will get insects. And this is what I mean by the gravel. The gravel actually breaks up the surface layer, the surface of the water, so that mosquitoes have a hard time laying their eggs. So this disrupts the meniscus of the water and that's where the mosquitoes attach their eggs. They hang upside down. You put in some light gravel or some um, uh, big rocks or gravel just to disrupt that layer, you pretty much won't get mosquitoes. It's, you'll still wanna dump it occasionally in case they do lay eggs. Um, but insects need water too and you wanna make it shallow enough so that they'll fall out. Um, even mud puddles count as a water source. Birds are happy to drink and bathe in a, in a puddle. Um, and butterflies, as I said, engage in a behavior called puddling. Controlling mosquitoes is pretty easy, as I just said. Um, if you have ponds, there is a bacteria that you can put in that keeps them from laying their eggs. Their eggs. I do not suggest the, uh, the little fish that you can buy. It's called a, I think, mosquito fish. Yeah. Don't buy those. They're a very bad form of biocontrol. Um, and then in winter, in Montana, how do you keep water going throughout the winter? Solar baths will keep it um, moving. Once it gets really, really cold, that's not going to work. But then there are heated bird baths, um, and you can get a de-icer if you have electricity. So you can have this even during the winter. And then lastly, you never know who will show up in your bird bath. I would, I would just I could die happy if a bobcat showed up in my yard. All right, we're gonna sw switch to cover. Um, this is the third component of the Garden for Wildlife program. And we, we talk about cover because not only can a plant provide a food source and shade, this is where it's gonna provide cover all throughout the year, depending on the plant. Um, so wildlife need places to hide from predators. And if they're a predator, they need places to hide from their prey. So again, you're offering an option for all kinds of creatures that need that space, that place to hide. Um, and as these photos will demonstrate, plants are the main way that wildlife find cover. Some provide food and will do a double duty, providing cover as well. Um, they also need cover from the elements. Like look at today, like a sudden, suddenly it starts snowing. They need somewhere to be able to escape and be safe. 
They'll seek shelter during times of extreme heat and cold, rain and snow, um, and evergreens uh, provide cover all year round. <laughs> all right, it's people on Zoom, you can't hear me that, but there's a hammer party going on downstairs. All right, plants with thorns offer um, added protection for small wildlife. Um, and we have a couple of plants that have, that are native with thorns. Um, providing cover, oh, density. So try and think about like texture and height, but try and be dense about how you plant your garden or yard. Um, that will really provide a lot of cover. That way they can go from plant to plant all over your space. Um, and if you plant in large patches of native species, um, think about good garden design and you can end up with a really beautiful garden. It doesn't have to be the HOA uh, blight in the neighborhood. It can actually be very beautiful. Um, cover is important because many species will just never visit an open yard that's mostly lawn. So you're not gonna get critters. Like if your goal is to have wildlife and you have a, a monoculture yard, you are, are actively keeping critters away that might otherwise come to your space. Um, wood thrushes need the cover of trees and shrubs and for, to uh, forage and for the branches and they hang out in the leaf litter. So if you have none of that, they're not, that's one, that's one species you're not gonna see. Um, and they're rapidly declining in part because of lots and other you know, concrete areas. So your guard actually could help them out. Um, even dead plants are full of life. This is the Coeur d'Alene salamander, and it's found here in Western Montana. And if you have leaf litter and some moisture, you could, you could, and there's a water source, you could get this salamander in your space. Um, they hide under uh, logs and leaf litter and rocks, um, and then they use that space for cover. And that's also where they're gonna find food too. You can build a brush pile by stacking logs or branches into a pile to become like a wildlife hotel without making it formal. You can just throw a bunch of things that you have in your space. Um, a brush pile is it for everyone. Again, if, if it's a blight, if you don't like it, um, or if you're in a fire prone area, I would not suggest that. Um, but if you can, even just a big dead log offers a lot. Uh, Fallen leaves provide, as I said, an important cover, um, but also, can you find the toad? <laughs> yeah. they, they use that as camouflage to evade predators and also find their own prey. And if you really want to get excited, exciting, you can make what, what's called a toad abode <laughs> or a frog house. Just put it in your garden. If you have a cracked terracotta pot, but upside down, make sure there's water nearby. Boom, tow to boat. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, snakes will go in there too. It's a really great um, safe spot. They're not gonna live in it. It's just a roosting site, but they'll, they'll take cover. They might even find some insects in there to eat. And it's a really great activity to do with kids. Um, <clears throat> the last one I'll show you are roosting boxes. You can build these or buy these. Um, this is different than a bird house. This is again, a spot for birds or bats even um, to find cover in, in uh, over, overnight. So you can put up roosting boxes. Um, you'll see that the hole is at the bottom versus at the top and that's because they're not building a nest. So it can be down there. Um, also when the heat rises, so they're gonna hang out near the bottom. So that brings us to places to raise young. Um, we've talked about food, water, and cover. This one is really important. Um, it's great to provide food for a bird or uh, places for small animals to find cover. Um, but now we're talking about space and the resources needed to find a mate and engage in courtship. So for some critters, that's a small amount of area. If you get into the bigger animals, again, we're talking big spaces, um, but uh, they also need to be able to provide enough safety, food, and cover for their young in order for them to be to reach adulthood. So this is another important step. 
Um, plants are the main way that you can provide places to raise the young, but most birds will nest within trees or in shrubs. Um, some birds are primary cavity nesters, so like our woodpeckers, they make the hole. But then you have other birds like burrowing owl or uh, right now, so, uh, barred owls. A lot of our owls are secondary cavity nesters, meaning they need another creature to make the hole for them. And we also have a flying squirrel. So we have a lot of creatures that rely on woodpeckers to make the hole for them. And then other animals will go in and move in. Um, great horned owls, they uh, don't even build a nest. They just utilize like the hole that the woodpecker has created. Um, or even like the nook of a tree. You also have little, little friends. Um, <laughs> how many of you have ever found a deer, like a baby deer? In your in your garden or yard yeah like you almost step on them they're just so well hidden and so tiny but that's on purpose i used to work for fishing game agencies in a few different states and every spring our number one phone call i rescued this baby deer no you didn't no you didn't you really you stopped <laughs> um and i get the sentiment i i empathize with like the instinct to help um, but this is the tactic. This is the defense tactic that their moms have created. Um, rabbits will do the same thing. Um, but uh, they'll spend most of the day hiding in the vegetation um, and trying to avoid predators. Um, species that don't directly care for their young, like turtles, uh, need that vegetation, those plants that you've pre uh, planted to hide their babies to avoid predators. Um, and even some of our snakes. So we have... Um, I think it's, well, one species that uh, our rattlesnake give birth to live young, and then they teach them how to hunt. They need a space to do that successfully. I'm not saying you necessarily want like a rattles den in your backyard, but like if you live, some people are not happy, <laughs> but if you live in a space where that is a, a creature that you'll find, like we have bull snakes where I live, um, and they need that space to be able to raise their young successfully too. Um, like I said, cavity nesters will use nesting boxes. Um, for instance, um, har not harlequins, but um, you just glitched. Um, wood duck. Who said it? Wood Thank you. Good. My brain just like stopped. <laughs> wood ducks will use cat like uh, man-made cavity nesters, artificial nest um, boxes, and then so will wrens. For wrens, you want to make sure the hole is really tiny. And if you if you notice over the year that the hole has gotten bigger you need to start over and put a patch on it because that's usually done by bigger birds and especially um, house sparrows, they'll pick at it to make it big enough for them and then the wrens won't use it. So if you want wrens, you gotta make sure that hole stays the right size. Um, but warblers, ducks, owls, like uh, they'll use nesting boxes, artificial nesting boxes and um, uh, bluebirds. That's actually how that species was really helped to be brought back. Okay, um, well, there it is. They've helped bring the bluebird populations to recover after they crashed in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and uh, as suburbia spread and the woodlands were, um, and, and took over the woodlands, uh, the boxes have actually helped that, that species come back and recover. But it's not just birds that need nesting places. Bees also need nesting places to, uh, as well. We have over 4,000 species native to the to North America. We have over 470 in Montana. And I saw a study that they found um, like 300 unique species in Yellowstone alone. These are just our bees. So we have a lot to, a variety. They all help pollinate. They all have an importance. They're all a part of that food chain. Um, but unlike honeybees, most native bees don't form hives. They're solitary nesters that require nesting tunnels in the ground or decaying wood or plant stems. So if you have plants like um, cone, purple coneflower and yarrow and something else that's got a tall stem. Hmm? Goldenrod. Goldenrod, they're gonna burrow in those stems. So don't cut them down. That's another common thing people would cut doing, like kind of clean up the garden. I know that looks pretty for one norm. And may I offer an alternative norm? Is there are creatures that are overwintering inside those stems? So it's really important to leave those alone. Um, 
once spring has come and the frost has passed and the critters leave, if at that time you want to go and do some maintenance, you could, but wait till they've till they've left their um, the eggs. Um, leave some bare ground also in your space for ground nesting bees. And if you want to do that near like the brush pile um, and you want to make it kind of muddy, you'll end up with some bees or native bees that will burrow in there. <clears throat> mm, that's a missing page. So um, like I said, leave the dead flower stalks intact over the winter. Um, if you need, they'll do, they'll do it lower down. Um, but I suggest just leaving them alone. Um, and then after spring has come, then they will exit and they'll start all over. And then you can cut the dead stalks back. This is an example of a uh, puddler. So if you come down to our booth, we have a, it's just a terracotta bottom. You can just take that, like I said, to make mud, make it look just like this. Put some gravel or big rocks in there and then fill that up with water and you'll kind of have the whole effect. Um, but a bowl of mud could be a really important resource to allow wildlife to raise their young. Um, bat houses are another really, really great example. Does anyone have bats that they have seen at their house? But they're nesting and roosting somewhere. Um, if you have siding, sometimes they'll actually go up into the siding. If you have big trees like ponderosa pine and some of our trees with like really big bark, um, ponderosa pine is a good one, but they'll actually nest underneath the, the bark. They can't, they're so, the space they need is so tiny. It's it's shocking. But um, if you have seen bats, I would really encourage you to put a bat house up. It's only gonna offer extra space for them. And one bat will eat about a thousand mosquitoes a night. So if you have 10 bats in your house, that's 10,000 mosquitoes that you're not having to suffer. So I'll take that. Um, if you need help on bat house recommendations or distance or like where to put it, um, talk to me. Um, there's some criteria and like it needs to be 12 feet off the ground. Yeah. Yes. Come talk to me after. I was just looking at the clock. Um, all right. So the next step, the last, it's not the next, but the, the last thing I want to go over is um, sustainable gardening. So food, water, cover, places to raise young. These are the four elements, but we want you to do that sustainably. Don't use chemicals. Don't use neonicotinoids. Don't use pesticides. All of that gets into the system. Um, uh, once you provide food, water, cover, and places to raise young in your space, it's really important to maintain that in an environmentally friendly way in order to keep all those critters we just discussed. Right? If you spray something, if you spray an area with a with a herbicide, that's going to get into the mice or butterflies. Um, and you might not have mason bees for the year. And if you don't have mason bees, you might not have tomatoes that you were really wanting to grow. So it's all really, really affected. <clears throat> as fun as it is to run outside, um, please keep your kitty indoors. Um, I don't know if you've all seen the study, but they did one in Minnesota and they kill like, it's in the millions per year. How many native birds, outdoor cats will kill each year? Um, this is my kitty was, and she never went outside, despite how much I'm sure she wanted to. Um, you can uh, <clears throat> get the um, the window placards that make it look like there's a shadow on your window that keep birds from running into the glass. Um, take the feeders down when they're moving, when there's migration happening. Um, use organic gardening techniques. There are native creatures that eat like uh, what we would consider a pest. Um, so we have a native ladybug. Use that one, don't use the non-native ladybug. Um, and and the, the gardening stores will sell you the non-native one and they don't do it to be malicious. They just don't know. So do your research, make sure you get the native ladybug. Um, a very good friend of mine spent his whole PhD working on ladybugs and so his five-year-old will yell at me and call their ladybird beetles, Naomi. I am so sorry. So they're not ladybugs, they're ladybird beetles, but we all know what in the figure. Um, so use ladybugs, use sustainable gardening methods. Um, turn off your lights at night, reduce your landscape lighting, have light face down rather than up. A lot of that can go a long way during the migration. <clears throat> um, plant native plants, use rain barrels. 
um, create a rain garden. This is a picture of our AmeriCorps a few years ago, creating a rain garden down in Missoula at the mud, the mud office, mud station. Um, reduce your lawn, use imper um, um, remove impermeable, impermeable surfaces. Plant shade, um, that will also help with your cooling and heating costs. If you have a push mower and you have the physical capability of using a push mower, I suggest it, um, or electric equipment. And then also leave your leaves. That's a big thing. Leave your leaves after the fall. When, if you have maples, let them, let them stay throughout the winter. Um, I had someone talk to me about that today. That's a mulch layer that's gonna provide a lot of nitrogen back into your garden. Yeah. That has a different tannin. Um, it will change what you are able to grow underneath that tree. If you want to, there are lots of plants in Montana that will grow under pine and spruce needles. Um, I would suggest reframing what you want to grow under there. That does well under spru spruce and pine. If you want like wildflowers, um, you would need to, to alter that mulch. Uh, yeah. So like kinikinik, um, depending on your elevation, some of our berry plants, some of our shrubs do really well with that really high acid content. Yeah. Oregon grape. Oregon grape, that one loves being under those trees. Um, okay. Uh, like you said, leave your leaves and if you must remove them for whatever reason, um, at least compost them. Again, that nitrogen can be put back into your garden when it's time. Um, shred it, compost it. <clears throat> um, we're lucky in Missoula, we have a composting site where we can drop off truckloads of leaves and other compost, but take, don't take it to the landfill. It's gonna end up decaying and going nowhere into the environment. If there's a, those are lined, so it's not gonna go anywhere. So you can go from this beautiful McMansion, if that's what you want. That's great, you do you. Um, uh, this is beautiful, this is a beautiful home, I'm not gonna lie. But if your goal is to have wildlife, this is not your friend. This monoculture lawn is not gonna, there's nothing safe for an animal to go across your lawn, especially small creatures, small birds, butterflies, bees, snakes, reptiles, amphibians. There's nothing safe for them. Um, you don't have to rip out your entire lawn. I have dogs. I still need lawn space, okay? But you can find a compromise and maybe have something that looks a little bit more like this. Try to mimic nature, different heights, different textures, different spacing, um, different things that bloom throughout different parts of the year. I have a guide uh, that's on my website. I can share with anyone who wants. Um, that's unique to Missoula County, so it's not gonna be exactly like up here but it shows you what's flowering that's native in what month and what that color is. So if you're like, I want something that's got color every month during the growing season, we can help you create that list. Um, so if you go to nwf.org slash garden, which has been on every one of these slides, on there is a button called the native plant finder, type in your zip code and it'll give you a list of every species that's, a, that's unique to our area. Um, your goal should be 50 to 70% natives. Again, plant your tomatoes, your peppers, your basil, those are attractants, but you need the natives to bring in the native pollinators to pollinate your tomatoes. <laughs> and if you ever have a season where you're like, God, I'm just not getting any tomatoes, or I get the flower, but I get no fruit, you're missing pollinators. And I've had to go out there, I've had bad years, and I take a Q-tip and I have to self, I have to like pollinate my own flowers. Um, there's something missing. And if you plant some other plants around and in, in, in that area, it's going to help bring in pollinators. And don't forget, I didn't say this, but our nighttime pollinators, a lot of people think that's bats and that's not wrong, but our bats in Montana are insect eaters, but they eat insects at night. The insects are on plants. So they inadvertently pollinate our plants, but that's not their objective. Um, but we do have some beautiful nighttime moths that come out. We have sphinx moths. Has anyone ever seen a sphinx moth come out at night? It's like, I get, I like jump up and down. It is so beautiful to see. And it's a big, huge moth. They're really special. Um, so try to get 50 to 70% native plants. You will get 50% more wildlife in your space. Again, trying to mimic nature. You can do this at home, um, at your workplace, school. If, again, if you're a school 
setting, please come talk to me. Um, place of worship, a park, a rooftop, wherever it suits your fancy, you will bring birds, bees, and butterflies into your space. Um, that is the crux of the program. Those four things, food, water, cover, places to raise young and doing it sustainably. Um, if you are doing those things or if your goal is to work on those things, that is what the Guard for All Life program is. We do have a certification process. If anyone's interested, it's completely optional. Um, we have people all over the country that are enrolled in the program. We do have a really pretty sign that if you want, you can put up in your garden. Ours is co-branded with Montana Wildlife Federation. So they get $5 of every certification in the state of Montana. Um, they're our affiliate. And uh, there was a study that also came out in 2021 that summarized that yard certified as wildlife habitat through our program um, showed a wider variety of bird species compared with more traditional yard landscaping. So it is effective if you use that uh, flyer that I handed out. And if you didn't get one when you came in, they're by the they're by the table. On the back of it is all of the things we just talked about and kind of pick and choose from there what you might be able to add to your garden. This is the bloom guide I said that I have that's unique to Missoula County. And it shows you what month and what color shrubs, plant, or shrubs, trees, not trees, shrubs and flowers. Um, and if you want to help with climate change, this is one of the ways we can combat it, is planting native plants. <clears throat> when you certify, you become a member of National Wildlife Federation. And um, there's a bunch of other benefits, like you get the magazine that'll start coming to your house and 10% off on the catalog. Um, but mostly I just like it as a way to share with my neighbors that I that my garden is wildlife friendly. Um, luckily I live in a neighborhood where nobody cares what you do in your space. We have people who don't touch it and people who are like obsessive and everything in between. Um, so I'm really lucky that I live in a space that people are um, open to me. You know, I don't mow the grass. I don't use pesticides or anything like that. Um, but it is a way to have a conversation with your neighbors. Um, but like I said, there's our website. If you click on the native plants button, that will take you to where you type in your zip code and you can get more and it will show you how to do native plants, butterflies, and then help you organize your list of whatever you want to plant. Then I can, if you go downstairs, you'll find all the local nurseries. So once you get your list of what you want to plant, get it from a local nursery. There's two in Missoula and I saw a bunch more up here in the Kalispell area that uh, they have a really great triple divide. And what's the other one? What is it? For native plants. Thank you. Um, you can start here, or you can also go to the the one, this one, nwf.org slash garden. Um, I also have our posters downstairs if anyone's interested. We have our birds, backyard birds, bats, and Montana bumblebees. Um, there's a book down there also that shows you how to go from purchasing a new place with like a blank slate all the way to those photos at the end. And that's it, that's me. I am Emzula, if you have any questions, I will hang out and answer them. But um, I really hope that this is helpful and that if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, that's my contact information. So thank you for coming, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you, Naomi. Thank you all. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have a mix of like non-native and native plants? Would that mess with your certification? If you're mm -hmm. to no, we <clears throat> we don't want to discourage people from not participating. Like if your goal is to have say 50% native, we want you to be able to amplify that voice. Um, no, it doesn't prohibit you. Okay. Yeah. Just the same way that plants like vegetables aren't native. But by all means, have your vegetable garden. I'll say that like apple trees and stuff. Like, yeah, that's sure. all right. That's all right. For apple trees, or if you're planting fruit trees, um, bears will come in. And I I think having a fruit tree is a, is on par with adopting a pet. If you're going to do it, do it responsibly. Do it correctly. If you have fruit, please pick up the fruit at the right times when the bears are starting to fatten up um, and fence them out. Otherwise, again, a dead bear is a dead bear. Again, our goal is to live, to cohabitate with them. Yeah. 
Can you have the little fog house? How yeah. far away do they have to that does that need to be by uh, the water source? If you're um, so for um, reptiles, it can be pretty far from the water source. If they're an amphibious species, I don't know the number of feet, but within within thirty feet, if I made it up, yeah, they go they go a bit outside of the water, but they need to be able to hide and then get back to the water safely. So try not to have it too far. Yeah, they need, so if you have like this, you know, little stopover sites along the way, that'd be okay. But they just need to keep their skin moist. So have water out on the ground for them. Yeah. Any questions online? Yeah. Do yeah. you want to talk about the bats? Yes, I can talk about bats. But one thing, yeah. Um, I was just curious when you're cleaning up your garden in the spring, how would you, is there any indicators of when it's safe to cut stuff with bats? Um, I think there is, and I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Um, I would wait till frost, the last frost, and then I would wait a couple of weeks because after that last frost is when those eggs are going to start coming out, like the whatever's inside. Um, so I would wait a few weeks to really give them a good chance. And then if you can, leave the very bottom a few inches. That actually helps the new green stuff from that um, mm -hmm. the little mm -hmm. frost. You still got that little... And it's also providing um, shade for that for that mulch layer that's just below. And um, the less you want a good mulch layer, because your water won't evaporate as quickly. And the slow, like the your temperature of your soil needs to rise at a healthy rate rather than all of a sudden it's just really hot. Um, and that's going to have the same effect on the eggs that are in the soil or in the stems. Well, it makes sense. Utilize any of that stuff if you do cut it down and then leave it like like toss it in the woods or something. Is it still useful for them? Yes. Yeah. Now the eggs, like if you do it, the eggs are still inside. They might still exit safely. Um, but other creatures will still use it, like especially mice and um rabbits. Oh yeah, please. Okay, so bats. Um, we have 15 different bat species in Montana. They require, they, you shouldn't have a bat house any closer than 12 feet from some sort of perch. So if you put them on a tree, let's say, and like six feet away is a big branch, all the owl has to do is sit and wait for them to exit the bat house. So they need to be far enough away. So if you have a pole, that's your best option, top of on a chimney. How high up off the ground? Because we have a bat house and um, that was built from like plants, mm -hmm. not built back. Um, it's not painted black. It should be black. In Montana, you should paint it black. Okay. And that's because of our, we lose heat. We don't have enough, like, hot days. And so the black paint will keep that heat. Out. Which, which direction should it be? Uh, I want to say south. I have a I have a document that outlines everything. I can't remember all of it off the top of my head, but I can email it to you. Okay. Yeah. Because so, we're not getting any. I know they're there because we see them. Yeah. But I don't think they're hanging out in the house. Um, <laughs> It also I'm takes to make it from east, so facing east. But I'm not sure if it's high enough on off the ground. Okay. And so we can I, put it up higher. I can't remember the direction, so I have to go back and look. Um, and it also takes them a few seasons to get comfortable and feel safe to go in it. So if it's relatively new, that wouldn't surprise me. Okay. But if it's not, okay. Let me let let me email you the the, the document I have because it's from the um the Batman Society. But it's got some adaptations for Montana. And there's plans on there too if anyone wants to build their own. They're really cute. You get the chance to put it back in the fun. And they can see so. Okay, so we are at the time. So thank you all. Yeah. All right, we appreciate you all coming today.